take this mask off. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Cooney. I'm president of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. And uh, let me tell you what a pleasure it is to see live people in, in together. Yeah. It's wonderful. I know we've seen a lot of you on the Zoom calls we've been doing for the last two years, uh, including the mayor, Rockton, who's here with us. And uh, it's you know been a way to convey a lot of good information and it's been great technology, but I don't know about you, being in person with people and uh, being able to share information and make introductions and all of that uh, is really meaningful to me. So I'm, I'm happy that you're here with us and uh, this is really the first time I think we've been together for a Good Morning Metro South in two years. Um, so yeah, it's nice to... So, it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome you here for another Good Day Metro South. Uh, so this is our monthly program that we hold. We, we hold it like an interview uh, session, kind of like a like a morning program, and uh, we've been doing this for 25 years, and uh, have covered a lot of ground, a lot of topics, had a lot of great speakers. Um, we want to thank Stonehill College, uh, in particular, for today for hosting us, and uh, I wanted to recognize uh, Katie Correll uh, Dykeman, who's the director of the Martin Institute. I know she was here. Is she still here? Uh, she, she went upstairs to a class, okay. Well, she was instrumental, as well as uh, Doug Smith, uh, who's head of advancement here. And of course, hosted us uh, last October uh, for one of our first uh, in-person meetings, so uh, outside, up at the President's office. So uh, we are pleased to be hosting Ken Turner, CEO of the Mass Life Sciences Center here today. Ken, welcome to Easton and to the Metro South area. We're going to hear from him in a little bit. Um, we have a very full program, but I would like just to cover a couple things. One is the Mass Office of Business Development. Uh, they have recently awarded uh, the Chamber uh, a Regional Economic Development Initiative grant, and uh, we'll be working closely with them uh, in the year ahead on issues of regional importance. And those topics uh, could be life sciences, they could be water, uh, sewer expansion, uh, they could be transportation uh, and infrastructure improvements and that type of thing. So we. Wanted to let you know that. We were notified on Monday uh, that we'll be working closely with them. Many of you know Margaret and Susan who have been on our calls and have been in the city uh, and they are appointed to the Brockton area to support us. So we look forward to following up with you on that. And the second is the Cape Verdean Association of Brockton Region received a $1 million grant from the Small Business Administration. That was just announced a short time ago. And they are working with five uh, spokes. They are the hub and there are five spokes. The chamber is one of those spokes. and that. Our, in, this initiative is designed to focus on small uh, city-based minority uh, veteran uh, type businesses that maybe did not um, access or were not, were not able to access uh, support from the federal government to uh, keep their business or get their business up and going during this pandemic. We know by data that they that group was most impacted by uh, the pandemic and so the federal government uh, chose the Cape Verdean Association out of 800 applications, only 50 were chosen. And uh, so it's a great resource to have, and we'll be bringing more information to you on that. So again, welcome, and uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, at this time, I would like to remind you that there are green Q&A sheets on your table. If you have a question for Ken Turner, uh, please just jot it down and hand it, uh, hand it up this way, and, and if we have time, we will ask as many as we can. Uh, Aside from that, it's now my pleasure to introduce our MC for today, uh, Attorney Masa Kambabe. She is a Chamber Vice Chair of Community Affairs, and she owns a law firm here in the town of uh, Easton and services uh, clients internationally, uh, many in the medical field, but all over. Uh, her law firm is Masa uh, Kambabe Immigration Law, and Masa, welcome. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and see all of you. Um, 
I've had the great fortune of being asked to teach an immigration class here as an adjunct professor, and uh, so it's nice to be back in person. I'm hoping that I'll be invited back in the future and be able to teach it in person, because it was virtual, and uh, it was amazing, though, to see how wonderful the students were, and I'll be talking a little bit about that later. Um, so I'd love to start by thanking our chamber ambassadors in, in attendance today. We have Richard Hook from SCU Credit Union, Brenda Karens from OCES, and Catherine Light for Envision Bank. Thank you so much for your uh, assistance. And I'd also like to thank, we have some elected uh, officials here today, uh, Dottie Fulginetti from my town of Easton, who's the chair of the select board. And the mayor of Brockton, Robert Sullivan. And state representative, Michelle Dubois. So today's Metro South event is being hosted here at the wonderful Martin Institute at Stonehill College. Uh, it's a Catholic institution of higher learning founded by the Congregation of the Holy Cross. It's a community of scholarship and faith anchored by a belief in the inherent dignity of each person. And so through its curriculum of liberal arts and sciences and pre-professional programs, Stonehill provides an education of the highest caliber and fosters critical thinking, free inquiry, and the inter-exchange of ideas. Stonehill College educates the whole person so that each Stonehill graduate thinks, acts, and leads with courage towards the creation of a more just and compassionate world. And as I referenced earlier, I taught an immigration law class, and the topics that the students chose to do their end of uh, year project on really just um, touched my heart because they were so compassionate, so understanding, um, and wanting to understand more, and then educate their colleagues and their students, you know, their fellow students about how immigration can impact each one of us and our communities. The Joseph W. Martin Institute for Law and Scholarship, and excuse me, for Law and Society was established in the memory of Joseph Martin Jr., who lived between 1884 and 1968. He was the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, and as a congressman representing a nearby district, Speaker Martin had a close relationship with the college and received an honorary Doctor of Letters degree in 1955. In 1986, President Ronald Reagan signed into law legislation for the creation of an institute at Stonehill College in Martin's honor. And so the Joseph W. Martin Institute for Law and Society was constructed by Stonehill in 1990 with congressional funding. And so today what I'd like to do is introduce um, two Stonehill representatives here with us today. Uh, first is Dr. Marilena Fitzsimmons Hall and Dr. Bronwyn Bleakley, and they're in the college's science department. Dr. Marilena Fitzsimmons Hall earned her bachelor's in chemistry in 1992 from McKill University in Montreal, Canada. She then earned her PhD at the California Institute of Technology. She was an adjunct professor at Massasoit Community College, another great partner of the chamber, uh, teaching general chemistry from 1999 to 2000, and she now serves as chair of the Department of Chemistry since 2017. She also served as faculty senate president from 2013 to 2017. Dr. Bronwyn Bleakley earned her bachelor's in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Arizona and a PhD, I like, I like the title of this, in evolution, ecology, and behavior with a professional area certificate in animal, animal behavior and a minor in college teaching from Indiana University. It just sounds really fascinating. Um, she completed her postdoc training as a National Science Foundation International Research Fellow based jointly at the Center for Ecology and Conservation, and she's currently professor and chairperson of biology here at Stonehill. So please welcome uh, professors Dr. Marilena Hall and Bronwyn Bleakley. So obviously a lot of conversation is happening in the, in the business world about experience and how do we teach our students who are graduating to then get into the workforce. So what can you tell us about the relatively new Shield Science Building and the facilities it provides to Stonehill students as they prepare for careers in the life sciences? 
Um, yes, yeah, so the building was built in 2009, and um, you know the faculty who teach in it got to design it in a very specific way so that we could best develop the skills that um, our students will need going into the workforce. Uh, things like teamwork, well, lots of teamwork and group work, problem solving, in addition to you know what you would expect, which are just really good laboratory facilities. And, uh, and the, we'll maybe talk a little bit about research today, but uh, every faculty member got a research space that they got to design to suit the way they do their particular type of research, and um, uh, you know, which we didn't really have in the old building, not in such a, a, a specifically designed way. And so our students benefit from that by uh, doing research in those spaces. Thank you. Did you want to add anything? Yeah. All right, and so the next question is, you know, regarding the percentage of Stonehill students that graduate with a degree in life sciences. So where do their studies take them, and how does participation in the research help students prepare for their post-grad careers? So approximately 15% um, of the students at Stonehill. Uh, Stonehill has um, between 2,400 and 2,500 students, um, uh, undergraduate students uh, at any given time, and about 15% of those um, major in uh, life sciences. And um, the curriculum is quite integrative, so our students really take uh, courses across the curriculum, so biology students are going to take chemistry and physics. Um, likewise, uh, environmental science students um, are, are going to do the the same thing. Chemistry is going to come and take a little bit of biology or physics. And so that kind of interdisciplinary um, curriculum means that those 15% of students are really interacting with each other and with the faculty in these special spaces. That takes them out to all kinds of careers. So um, just as an example, there's a biochemistry alum um, who's part of the development team at Pfizer. Uh, an alum who did research with me uh, is on the production team um, at Moderna. And I had a uh, I emailed with a student from environmental science last week. Um, she is on the, uh, the team that's tracking the great white sharks that have started coming um, back up the, the coast as part of um, right, kind of ecology and conservation. To just give you a sense then of the range of outcomes um, that our students achieve. Anything further, Dad? I think she no? covered it, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the experiences that the students get are incredible because it really equips them to, once they step off campus, right, and start looking for positions, uh, that they're really prepared and excited and have that backdrop that employers really find useful. So it's great that you have so much to offer. Thank you. We can well, say a little bit more about the, the research, if you want. Sure. Um, so, you know, we educate our students in research because we're scientists and you know we we hope that they'll become scientists too but they really learn a lot of useful skills for the workforce and uh, I mentioned teamwork summer research really develops teamwork the students work uh, with a professor, but usually one professor has a few students, and um, and they they all work as a team together. And often, when the students sort of gain some autonomy, the professor can sort of step back and let the students kind of just uh, direct their research a little bit. Um, but one of the most important things I think they gain from research that they don't get in courses is is um, in a lab course, an experiment, we usually have it designed so it's gonna go well, pretty well, you know, like that it's gonna work out. But in research, that's not what happens. And that's not what happens in the real world. That's not what's happening at Pfizer and Moderna when they're developing drugs, you know? So our students get to experience that trial and error and, and develop that re the resilience to get through it and to remain hopeful and to keep going and to problem solve and figure out, you know, how to eventually get that experiment to work or to recognize when you have to move on on to something else. So those are just a few of the, of the great outcomes of research. And we have a, a very um, well-developed research program in the summer where our students work full-time for eight to 10 weeks. And it's funded by the college. It's called the Shore Program. And, um, and it's, you know, we usually have many students usually participating, like 50, There's something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it's a, a really fantastic program. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you both here. We look forward to maybe having a tour one day oh. uh, when things improve at the, at the Shield Center. And um, so thank you for connecting with uh, all of us here at the Chamber.
Okay, and so now we're pleased to have um, an update on an initiative that be began a few years back when the Chamber commissioned a study on developing the life sciences industry in Brockton. Shortly after, MIT conducted a study on the same industry possibility. And so I'd like to introduce Emily Keyes Ines of Ines Associates and Eric Halverson, RKG Associates. Emily Keyes Ines is an award-winning planner, speaker, and writer. Her projects include downtown revitalization, strategic planning for waterfronts, corridors, and industrial areas, and larger scale comprehensive plans. Emily's focus is on creating plans that can be implemented. She is a member of the faculty at the City Planning and Urban Affairs Program at BU and is a member of CPUA's Board of Advisors. And she's also a member of the Urban Land Institute. Eric Halverson is a principal with RKG Associates, and he manages the company's New England operations and Boston office. His work supports both public and private sector clients in the areas of housing, economic development, market analysis, financial feasibility, and economic impact. Eric enjoys working at the intersection of economic development, housing, and market realities, and helping to translate findings into actionable strategies for clients. And please welcome Emily Keyes Ines and Eric Halverson. Thank you very much. It is such a pleasure to be with you today in person. Um, Eric and I are very excited to talk to you about a project that we've been working on in the city of Brockton with the city itself and with the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Um, this project is really looking at the topic that you all are talking about today, which is life sciences. So as we know, life sciences is a huge um, sector of multiple industries within Massachusetts. And one of the things that we have seen over and over again through um, the last few years is how much this is really impacting our uh, area, um, but primarily mostly around Boston and Cambridge. You see from these quotes here that Boston is getting uh, a huge amount of venture capital funding and it's running out of space. You're also seeing, and this is a nice tie-in to the discussion of the workforce, that uh, People are needing to, companies are needing to hire people, and so where are these people? So a lot of this led us to um, uh, taking the, the studies that had been done before, primarily for us, the MIT study um, initially, and saying, how can Brockton participate in this? What assets does Brockton have to bring to the life science industry, and how do we capture that? And so there's a lot. When we look at what's needed, workforce training is huge, partners, and then space, what land is available for different types of um, uh, buildings and businesses to uh, come on. And you can see some of these partners and see some of the, the land areas that might be. Uh, Brockton has been working very hard on its downtown, and we saw that as an opportunity perhaps for incubator space, but it needed a place for the businesses to move to. And so we were focused in our study on the Lovett Brook area. Now I'm going to turn this over to Eric, with whom we worked very closely to understand the market contacts for life sciences is not just in Brockton, but within the region. And I'm going to come back and tell you a little bit more about Love at Brook and the possibilities it brings, not just for Brockton, but in thinking about how it applies to the region as a whole. Great. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Great to be here in person. This is my first one in two years. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but exciting. Um, so thanks for the intro, Emily. Um, and we work very closely with Emily and, and other firms to sort of, when, when there's a planning study going on, we're often asked to try and figure out, well, if there's an area where something's gonna happen, what should happen there? What's more likely to happen? What is the market realities for that? And as Emily mentioned, we were fortunate enough to be able to stand on the shoulders of a couple of uh, projects that were done before we started the MIT study, and also a really interesting study that Mass Life Sciences had done back in 2018 to really identify the industry sectors that feed into this larger cluster called life sciences. So what does that actually mean? So we're able to use some of that information to come up with what the market context is for Brockton uh, and this larger region that Brockton could draw from. So I just wanted to start, the first question that we asked ourselves as we began is, well, if it's not necessarily happening down this way right now, where are these life sciences companies locating, whether they be uh, life science companies or incubator spaces? So um, there's a great uh, map and um, uh, that you can see here on the screen that shows the location of where the Mass Life Sciences sort of certified list of companies and incubators are. This certainly isn't an exhaustive list, but at least gives you an idea of where they are tending to locate. And you can see from the map, 
a lot along the pike, clearly the Boston-Cambridge market, but then as you go up Route 3 North, you go up toward the North Shore, Beverly and Salem area, and then out along 495 as you get out closer to Devons, for example. But as you start coming along 495 South and the Route 24 corridor, you can see that it starts to, to, tra to trail off a little bit. And so we started to ask ourselves, well, why is that and what can we do here in this region to leverage the assets that are available to the advantage? The next question we needed to ask ourselves is how do we define life sciences? So how do we start to look at um, the jobs that are in that sector and the market potential? So as I mentioned, in 2018, there was a great study that was done uh, for Mass Life Sciences that looked at these different subclusters to help define life science as an industry sector. And you can see they're sort of broken up into these four um, subclusters. One is drugs and pharmaceuticals, which is primarily the manufacturing of drugs and pharmaceuticals. The next is medical devices and equipment, again, mostly manufacturing of medical devices and equipment. Then the third is what I think a lot of us tend to think about, which is the actual lab, uh, the research and the development that goes into the production of or informs the production of uh, medical devices and pharmaceuticals. And then the last one is um, related to distribution. So once we actually make whatever it is, where do we store it, and then how do we get it out to the folks who need it? So these were the four subclusters that we looked at and then the uh, industry sectors um, that we analyzed there on the right. And so we started by saying, well, if we want to understand where this is happening, not only where the companies are, but also where the job clusters are, we took those industry sectors and we mapped where those jobs are. So the darker, the purple color, and this is a 40 mile radius around Brockton. That's what the sort of dotted line is on the outside. The darker the purple color, the greater the job concentration. The lighter the color, the, the less job concentration you see. So again, you'll see down in the Brockton area, again, it starts to fade away and gets much stronger, which correlates to where obviously a lot of those companies are located. <clears throat> but we knew that a 40 mile radius from Brockton in Massachusetts traffic could take you forever to get to, so that didn't seem realistic. So we needed to narrow that down a bit. So what we ended up looking at was a 15 mile radius, which covers much of the Metro South uh, region. Maybe that's a 30 to 45 minute drive uh, time. Seems a little bit more realistic for those who might need to come down this way. So this was the study area that we considered for the Lovett Brook site and for Brockton. And when we looked at um, the employment within that 15 mile radius to get a sense of uh, what jobs there are here now and then what are the projections for jobs in the future, um, the 2020 employment numbers across those four sort of subclusters totals to about 8,500 jobs, so a good amount of jobs. And you can see how that breaks down across those four subclusters. Most of them are in medical device equipment and then in the distribution sectors. We also wanted to figure out, well, what is the past growth trends been over the last 10 years? So we looked from 2010 to 2020 in those same subclusters to figure out how things may have changed. And you can see it's about 700 jobs that were grown uh, in, that, in that area over, the, over that 10 year period. Um, many of them were again in that sort of distribution side of things, but there was some good growth um, in the manufacturing of drugs and pharmaceuticals as well as in R&D. So those are good, good signs. Then we also wanted to say, well, What's the potential future demand for space since we are looking at it at a location in Brockton, the Love at Brook location, what's the demand? How could that location potentially feed into that demand? So what we did was we looked at job projections over the next 10 years out to the year 2030 and then translated those jobs into physical space. If we were able to attract those jobs here, how much square footage will we need to support those jobs? And that's the number that you see all the way on the right hand side there. And that was just calculated for um, sectors of the life science industry that were projected to grow. Some of them are projected to decline, but we focused on the ones that are expected to grow. So you could see over the next 10 years, about 350,000 square feet could potentially be supported within that 15 mile radius. Um, again, not all that is brand new physical space. Some of that might be existing buildings that might be vacant now and could be backfilled. Or as we're seeing so, in so many other parts of Eastern Mass, um, companies uh, like Alexandria, for example, just bought 1.3 million square feet in Andover of uh, old office buildings and they're planning on converting that into uh, GMP facilities for pharmaceuticals. So some of that could be conversion of existing space in the region, some of it could be new space, so just something to think about. I think it's really interesting 
when we think about the space that is here in this region, uh, the map on the right shows um, all the light manufacturing and heavy manufacturing spaces. So as we start to think about how to position this region, maybe it's potentially less about the R&D or there's less focus on that and there's more on the manufacturing and distribution side. So we thought that was kind of interesting just based on the assets that are here today, if there is a way to reposition those assets over time or build new in the Lovett Brook area, for example. Musical chairs today. So in taking all of that, um, one of the reasons that uh, we work so well with RKG Associates is they give us the base data that allows us to come up with plans that are based on facts and lead to implementation. And so as we look at the picture that Eric just described, we now want to apply it to our area, which is the Lovett Brook area. Um, this is the former uh, um, exit 18. Now I think it's 33A um, uh, off Route 24. And you can see, uh, hopefully this is, ah, yes, look at that. So here's Route 24 here. Route 27 here. And you can see that this uh, site already has an interesting mix of uses on it. The centerpiece is, of course, the Good Samaritan Medical Center with medical offices up here. We have a mix of restaurant and retail. Uh, the orange is single family. We have a church uh, with an associated uh, house next to it. And then we have the headquarters of Harbor One Bank. So it's unusual in that it does already have so many uses. We also have have a mix of um, multifamily. I think some of those buildings go up to about six stories here. Uh, the Westgate Mall is over here, and there's additional large-scale shopping up in that area. There's small-scale uh, single-family, maybe two-family residences down there. So it's a really mixed area. And the one uh, use I didn't mention, this uh, footprint here is a former movie theater that went out of business, as so many movie theaters have done, and was eventually demolished. And that is land that is actually almost landlocked, hasn't been developed. So as we start to think about what could happen in this area, we're looking at all of these resources. And finally, there is a brook, Lovett Brook, running through the area. And you can see it on some of the old maps I dredged up before Route 24 came in. It's actually underneath this building here, which is a 7-Eleven and a laundromat, and it's in a culvert at the moment. So although it's got associated wetlands, from ecological point of view, it's not fulfilling its, uh, um, its, its role in the area. I'm also going to introduce this to you in three dimensions. Uh, we like to look at things in both plans in three dimensions, so you can see, uh, we can see as we go through the fit scenarios that I'm going to show you uh, what the impact on the area is. So again, Good Samaritan here, Harbor One Bank, Route 24, Route 27 in the back, the movie theater, and then Lovett Brook coming through. The multifamily is on this side, so just to orient you. So what we did is we took the numbers that um, Eric and his team came up with, and then we also worked very closely with Ty and Bond, who do, um, as uh, civil engineers, they do a lot of site work for life sciences. So we were able to uh, think about the scale of the buildings that could fit on this site in terms of buildings that had actually been built, and that's critically important. And as Eric mentioned, um, uh, you know, many people have thought solely about lab for life sciences, we looked more towards maybe a mix of office and lab, but also manufacturing. The other key is understanding that Lovett Brook has a lot of locational advantages. I mentioned routes 24 and 27. There's also two bus routes that dead end here, um, and the uh, other components that um, I mentioned here, key being that Lovett Brook could help tie a lot of these things together. So what I'm going to show you now tends to get people very excited because it looks like buildings, but it's really a fit study. It says, given what we understand to be happening in the area, how do we see a future developing here? And we're showing it in phases. We're showing it first in three to five years for 1A, five to 10 years for 1B, and 10 plus for 1C. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about why these are so um, spread out in terms of scenarios. So the first thing you see is that we've got a manufacturing building here happening where the former movie theater used to be, an office lab on the corner here of this property that uh, really promotes the main entry into Good Sam with buildings on either side, and then we've added a mixed use with retail on the ground floor or restaurants on the ground floor and residential above that really speaks um, uh, up here. And again, this is a fit study, not an actual project. You can see in three dimensions how they look, and one of the advantages of having the uh, 
retail restaurant on the ground floor here is that in the next uh, phase, you're going to see that we're going to be moving the existing retail and restaurant. One of the advantages of scenario planning like this is thinking about the swing space and thinking about the ability for the existing businesses to stay on site. And so in this scenario, you see that we've moved the existing restaurant and retail over to the mixed use. We've added two restaurant pads in red, which I'll describe in a minute. That allows us to add more manufacturing here, keep the office lab here. One of the things that we learned from RKG's study is there's not a market in the near term for new purpose-built office lab in this area. The two restaurant pads you see here open up another opportunity for both the current residents and the uh, current employees of the area, as well as future residents and employees, and that is daylighting Lovett Brook, removing it from its culvert, adding walking trails in this area, and adding restaurants that allow for outdoor seating. So we're responding to the need of an, an environmental justice population in the area by greening it up, by addressing some of the environmental current concerns excuse me, by um, adding trees along a currently treeless uh, um, area uh, of sidewalk and uh, creating this uh, gateway space with the restaurants so that people feel more welcome in a space that somebody reported they used to fish in Love at Brook, but most people reporting to our surveys, uh, in our surveys, said that they were not comfortable being in this area. And again, you can start to see how this area starts to fill in in three dimensions and adding the restaurant. And again, this would be a five to 10 year scenario. Our final scenario, the 20 year scenario, just adds a new office lab building here with additional parking. And that's assuming that 10 to 20 years, the market, the fact that there are these other uses here improves enough to add office and lab. And you get to see that in three dimensions. You also see the remainder of this street using the development funds uh, brought forward by the businesses being able to address those environmental factors. Now, critical part of this fit scenario is that although all of these uses and buildings fit on this site, it is way more than the square footage than RKG estimated from the market. Um, and that's par in part because the demand that they looked at was based on past trends. And those past trends have shown that um, there's not a lot coming down to this area of the uses that we're looking at. So what we're recommending for both Brockton and as a wider discussion for the region, the coordinated marketing of these opportunities, finding uh, two developers and manufacturers of the locally trained workforce, affordable housing in this region compared to the other regions they're moving into, and opportunities for recreation. And you can see that there are benefits for the region in terms of well-paying jobs, workforce development, and strengthening the local ties between um, communities and the institutions that have been already mentioned today in terms of workforce education. For Brockton, it is increasing the commercial tax base, and um, in part, that's also increasing the jobs for existing residents. And then for the area, the existing residents and businesses would get significant traffic improvements, which has been a problem, uh, the new rec recreational area and new areas for businesses. And then finally, to bring it to a regional picture, the actions that need to happen, not just for the city, but at a regional level, is looking for those underutilized areas. What's preventing them from being used? Is it the regulatory structure? Is it underlying environmental conditions? For example, there's a lot of wetlands on the sites that we didn't touch. Um, and uh, then also in identifying clusters of locations. If we've learned anything from the spread to the west and the north of Boston, these businesses tend to like to be together. And those clusters of locations don't have to be all in one community. So we can see in Brockton a innovation in the downtown to an expansion in Lovett Brook, but growing companies are going to need to move beyond the relatively limited space in Lovett Brook. What areas are in your community that these businesses could be moving to. And then finally, thinking about connecting housing, transit to these jobs, and also the amenities that are likely to bring um, uh, new employees to the area to work in these businesses. And that may be the educational opportunities, the recreational opportunities, and that affordable housing. And with that, I'm going to leave that up here just briefly. That is our website. Happy to pass that on to anybody else. And thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much. Appreciate that. It's fascinating to see um, some of the potential in the area. Um, so at this time, I'd love to, um, you know, oh, I, I meant to um, also add in, sorry, Chris uh, will be able to send out a report uh, of this for those of you who are interested in getting some more of the information and being able to have it and reference. And um, I also would like to add that while I am entirely excited and looking forward to the snow, um, I'm a skier and my kids love sledding. Um, unfortunately, the mayor doesn't necessarily have that pleasure of viewing it with such joy and excitement and has a lot of logistical things he needs to deal with. So unfortunately, he had to leave to take care of the snow emergency. Um, so at this time, I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce our main speaker, Mr. Kenneth Turner from Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. He is the president and CEO, uh, and the Mass, Mass Life Sciences Center is an economic development and investment agency dedicated to supporting the growth and development of the life sciences in Massachusetts. He directs and oversees the center's operations, investment strategy, programs, and partnerships. Prior to joining uh, the MLSC, Mr. Turner served as Director of Diversity and Inclusion and Compliance with Massport. He oversaw and managed the authority's multiple diversity programs, included business, including business and supplier diversity, workforce diversity, and airport concessions, as well as all compliance initiatives associated with Massport's Disadvantaged Minority Women Business Enterprise programs. Previously, Mr. Turner served as Deputy Secretary for Administration and Finance for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Veterans Affairs. He has over 20 years of general management and executive experience in various Fortune, Fortune 100 media and packaged goods companies, including having served as Senior Vice President of Emerging Markets at AOL Time Warner, as well as having held various marketing positions at Hallmark Cards and Hasbro Toys. Mr. Turner is also a retired U.S. Navy captain and submarine nuclear weapons systems officer with 26 years of experience. He holds a B.S. degree in liberal arts from Southern University and A&M College, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And please welcome Mr. Turner. I'd be incredibly glad when we don't have to wear these anymore. <laughs> so uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for the kind invitation to get me out of Boston and Cambridge and out into the rest of the state, which I enjoy. Uh, and this is my first opportunity to meet with you here uh, in Metro South. So I'm going to start by thanking Chris and the Chamber for this opportunity uh, and our hosts uh, here at Stonehill College. And I also want to thank all of you for coming out today. I think it was said up front how nice it is to be in the room with real people for a change and not little squares on a computer, uh, which is what we're all kind of grown accustomed to over the last two years. So I hope that everyone's 2022 is off to a strong start. I can assure you that at the Life Sciences Center, uh, it has been um, a, an exciting time for us and my organization. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how many of you have been familiar with what we do, and so I thank uh, uh, Mesha for that uh, kind uh, explanation about what uh, the Science Center is all about and why it's important. But I want to come back to a theme, <coughs> excuse me, that I have already tried to surface and focus my team on every day in the year that I've been at the Science Center, uh, which is jobs jobs and jobs. Some of you may be familiar with MassBio uh, and their recent annual report of the industry. And in that, they're forecasting that by 2024, here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we need to add 40,000 net new jobs in the life sciences. 40,000. Now, if you're in my job, you go out and you visit with companies every day or every week, and I hear a constant theme. And that constant theme is, I kid you not, so incredibly consistent that it's, it's mind-numbingly scary, which is they cannot feel the jobs they have today. So if we can't feel the jobs we have today, Imagine 
where that goes in my head when I think about what we need to be doing as a state to, main, to make sure that me, we maintain our preeminence as the number one life science ecosystem here in the United States and arguably in the world. It's about having a ready, willing, trained, motivated workforce. So that is my number one concern among many concerns, as you might imagine, but it's all about how do we close our talent acquisition and retention gaps today and how are we going to meet the challenge of having 40,000 net new jobs by 2024. And so I've got a few slides here I think I'm going to walk through to kind of keep me from rambling. I, Joe is my vice president of marketing and communications um, for the center and they all get a little nervous when I start talking off the cuff, which by the way I've been doing for the last two minutes. So, <laughs> I, so I should go back to what Joe wrote to stay out of trouble. So how does this work? I can launch nuclear weapons but I can't like figure out, did I? Oh. Oh, you're upside down. Oh, my, ah, there you go. There you go. There we go. Thank you. There we go. So first I thought we'd start with a brief history of the center. I believe it's always useful to look back before you start looking ahead and not to assume that everybody is on the same page with regards to their knowledge uh, of where we came from. The Massachusetts Leadership Post in Life Sciences develop, Development reflects forward-looking public policy leadership which continues to this day. In 2008, the Commonwealth made a billion dollar, 10 year commitment to solidify the state's prominence in the life sciences. This ambitious effort, which became known as the Massachusetts Life Sciences Initiative, created a body, the Massachusetts Life Science Center, charged with carrying out the initiative. In 2018, the Massachusetts legislature passed and Governor Baker signed an act providing continued investment in the life sciences industry in the Commonwealth to invest an additional $623 million in bond authorization and tax credits over the next five years in education, research and development and workforce training. With these funds, the center serves as an economic development and investment authority with the mission of supporting the growth and the development of the life sciences here in the Commonwealth. Put another way, me and my team are part of an organization that serves as the hub of Massachusetts's life science ecosystem. In terms of how we have executed against that mission, since 2008, we have invested more than $850 million into our life sciences ecosystem, which has generated a leveraged $4.7 billion of investments in the common wealth and we've created more than 15,000 jobs. We run a number of different programs, many of them which have current uh, active rounds underway even as I speak, but I'd like to provide a quick overview of a few of the investments close to home for you all here uh, in Metro South. <clears throat> First, I've heard from day one of my tenure with the team about the standout partnership we have with Brockton Public Schools. We've invested more than $400,000 in the school system and provided nearly 100 students with lab training and internship opportunities. I also like to note that we have a strong partnership with the Boys and Girls Club of Metro South and I've had the privilege and the pleasure of visiting their camp Riverside at Lewis Park just this past August. Overall, the center has awarded $21.5 million to 240 high schools and middle schools throughout the Commonwealth. We have supported every Massachusetts County and Gateway City and all 39 Votech schools with the Life Science Program. This includes the three Votech schools that serve the Metro South region as well. And finally, I just want to give a plug to our partners at Quincy College. I've gotten a chance to visit with their president and the staff and the professors and I can tell you already we've formed a great working team. 
When we talk about workforce, I see partners like Quincy College as essential to working uh, with us to produce that ready, willing, and able workforce that I mentioned earlier, but more importantly, also with the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And no, they didn't write that. I put that in. <laughs> and finally, just pulling out some of, uh, some of these specific examples, if you just look at the metrics of what our funding has been able to accomplish, public investment in the life sciences has been a significant success for Massachusetts. You all know that we rank near or at the top of any metric that you can find in terms of R&D spending, NIH funding and investment, VC funding, STEM graduates, and professionals entering the life sciences fields. Now, what I'm really excited to talk about is what's coming next. We're very proud of what we've been able to accomplish, and a lot of success points to, and I think that success has been, and there's a lot of things that we should be excited about and take credit for and celebrate, but as I tell my staff, I think that our success across the Commonwealth has been what I call uneven. So let me talk a little bit about strategy and where I want to go to address that unevenness. We were fortunate to have KPMG and the Boston Consulting Group work with us, and I'm going to run through these relatively quickly because they can be a little bit mind-numbing, but the idea is to give you a sense of the context of how we went about doing the work that we did to get to the strategy that we got to. The K, what I asked KPMG to do was basically look at the ecosystem and the center's part and our role in it at the 40,000 foot level and then I worked with the Boston Consulting Group to say tactically how should we think about workforce development specifically and business development specifically. And so this just kind of gives you a sense of the methodology and I'm not going to stand here and try to read through this but as you can see, uh, they did brilliant work in terms of outreach and making sure that we had experts in the life sciences talking to us and not just us in an echo chamber talking to ourselves. And that led to what you see here, which is the strategy slide. And so to think about it this way, to kind of break it down in a simplistic form, we have three pillars that I want to focus on, innovation, biz dev and scaling opportunities and regionalization. But those three pillars are going to be underpinned and supported by workforce development, DE&I, manufacturing, and our ability to convene as an organization to drive those three pillars. So each one of those, okay, he's actually relying on me to know what I'm talking about. So let's see if I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to close that down. So, you know, when we think about innovation, and you look at where we are as an organization and where we are as a state, you know, I'll give you a great example. I heard Moderna mentioned earlier today, I think in the panel here, uh, one of the professors may have alluded to them. If you go back just 10, 13 years ago, and if you said mRNA, nobody knew what you were talking about. Nobody, most certainly not the VCs. You heard me talk about Massachusetts being number one in VC funding in life sciences. Well, we've got about $7 billion worth of capital amassed here in Massachusetts to invest in companies. But guess what I found out? They invest in a very narrow range of science. Oncology, neurology, infectious disease. That's where the bulk of that money goes. So if you're a scientist, working in an accelerator 10 years ago, a decade ago, and you came up with this notion of sRNA or mRNA, and by the way, I'm not a scientist, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a scientist, uh, they would look at you and not know what the hell you're talking about. And they are not interested in taking a risk that far out, right? Because these guys are here to make money and there's nothing wrong with making money. But the point being is, we supported them. The Life Science Center supported them. They started off with, Joe, keep me honest here, 13 employees, right? We forecasted growth for that company well south of where they ended up. Because, of course, none of us saw a once-in-a-century pandemic on the horizon. But that investment led to the creation of over 1,200 jobs, 13 to 1,200. Next year, you know what their projection is on job creation here in the Commonwealth? An additional 1,200 to 1,300 employees. Not to mention the facilities that they've built here to actually manufacture the vaccine that's now being distributed around the world. 
And so I bring that up not to break my arm patting myself on the back because I wasn't even around to make those decisions. But the point being is we have a cr critical role to play at the Life Science Center to say what's the next sRNA or mRNA that won't be supported by the VCs because the scene is too risky. So that's what that innovation block is all about. When I think about biz dev and our scaling opportunities, I mentioned earlier that when you think about the footprint of biopharma uh, across the country, if you look at the top 25 biopharma com companies in the world, about 20 of them are right here in Massachusetts and have, a, and have a footprint here in Massachusetts. The thing I worry about, though, is we're big on the R&D and little on manufacturing, right? They do the manufacturing down in Pennsylvania or in North Carolina or in Texas or Georgia, right? And I'm convinced that with the right amount of relationship building and strategic process, we've got to convince these guys that they need to have their R&D and their manufacturing here in Massachusetts. And I think that they can do that here in Massachusetts. You just have to learn that the world, I remember, let me go back about 25 years, date. well, I graduated in 1980, so that tells you how old I am. I'm 63 for those of you who don't do math in your head. <laughs> but I remember there was this poster that I think it was a New York, yeah, it was a New York, New Yorker magazine cover. And it basically said, I think it was something to the effect of, you know, the, you know viewing the world from Manhattan, right? Remember that drawing? And it was basically the world was flat once you got past, <laughs> you know, Liberty Island. We suffer from that here in Massachusetts. I'm a southern boy, right? I grew up in Louisiana. I went to school in Baton Rouge. My home was up in Monroe, Louisiana. It took me five hours to drive home and still be in Louisiana, <laughs> for the record. I drive five hours anywhere from here, right? And I'm in, I'm damn near D.C. Yet, we think that somehow, if my R&D facility is at Kendall Square, if I come to Brockton, oh my God, <laughs> right? The world is flat and beyond there be dragons. I'm like, so we've got to work with our companies to understand that doesn't it make more sense to drive to a facility that you built in Brockton rather than jumping on a plane at Logan and flying to Pittsburgh, right? And so there are companies that get it already and they're starting to do that math and understand that the time and the investment in travel and having their manufacturing facility so far outsourced doesn't make sense. They should be looking at Brockton. They should be looking at Lowell and Lawrence and Beverly and Devons. And so we've got to do some work. And so I'm working with my team, both on the business development side and the marketing side, along with my partners in government, to try to make the case, I think, for them to understand that you really want to be here and we can come up with creative solutions, whether it be tax incentives, land development, platinum ratings for cities, right? like you've done it uh, here in Brockton, that will ease the pain for them. And the thing that I've heard from them is, you know, Ken, you look at the cost of land, you look at workforce development, you look at congestion and traffic and affordable housing and all those issues that are rightly issues to look at. But you know what they're telling me the number one thing is? The absolute number one thing in terms of when they're making a decision about where they're going to build a plant. It wasn't what I thought. It is a surety around speed to development. That's what they're telling me. If you can guarantee me that when you break ground, we're going to finish that facility when we say we're going to finish it because it's all about speed to market, then count me in. I'll build it here. So we've got to get better at assuring them that if you're going to be in Brockton, if you're going to be in Norton, if you're going to build in Norwood, or if you're going to build, you know, out in Pittsfield or Lee or Springfield or Worcester, that by God, when you put a shovel in the ground, a year and a half later or two years later, that thing's going to open exactly when we say it's going to open, then I think we stand a competitive chance. But as long as we can't do that because of our squabbling, lack of partnership, lack of collaboration, too many zoning issues, the things that we don't control in state government, then we're always going to come up second and third. So we've got, to, we've got to do better. And I'm committed this year to really working with partners uh, at every level of government 
to make sure that we set the ground and make it fertile for us to make the argument to do manufacturing here, which leads to the next thing that I care about, which is workforce development and regionalization, and those two things go hand in hand. Because I'm convinced that if you build the manufacturing here, then we open up the job force beyond the R&D sector. Now, why is that important? You, we, by the way, have more advanced degrees and more R, uh, PhDs than any other state in the union. I'm a huge Jeopardy fan. I don't know who else watches Jeopardy, but I'm, I'm a huge Jeopardy. I always have been like a huge Jeopardy fan. And just anecdotally, if you watch Jeopardy just week to week, you know you have three contestants. Aren't you amazed at the number of times that those contestants are from Massachusetts? Yeah. I'm not kidding. It's like, it's, it's like mind-boggling how many times the, you know, one, one or two of those people up there are from Massachusetts. It's not by coincidence. It's because we've got very smart people here which led to our preeminence in life sciences to begin with, and thank Governor Patrick and the legislature in 2008 for recognizing that our number one resource ain't oil like Texas, it ain't corn in Iowa, it's people. We have the smartest people in the United States, and we harness that to lead to where we are in our preeminence. But back to my point, what if we were to create jobs that don't require a PhD? What if we create jobs that don't require an advanced degree? Tell you what, what if we create jobs that don't require a degree at all? They just require a person who is trainable, who is reliable, who has a good work ethic, and who is a team player. What if those are the requirements? Well, now we can bring jobs to our disadvantaged neighborhoods, our overlooked neighborhoods, et cetera, which then drives the DNI piece of this. We go from a lily white work environment, which is a problem, to now we got a problem. Now we're starting to solve the problem around diversity because we're bringing more people into life sciences. So for me, it's all interconnected, as you can see. If I fix one thing, it snowballs, it connects. We can drive diversity in a meaningful way and not pay lip service to it like so many corporations I work for, and I don't need to name them. Just look at my resume, you see where I work. <laughs> And if you want to convince me that I'm sitting in a room with 16 white guys at the top of the pyramid and I'm the only black guy in the room and one, there was always me and one woman. <laughs> Swear to God, lift to God's ears. Always. And that was diversity. And I'm somehow supposed to be convinced that out of like all the people, you know, 350 million people in America and I'm like the only smart black guy? Like really? <laughs> I, don't get me wrong, not the dullest knife in the drawer by any stretch of the imagination, but I ain't brilliant. Diversity can be had, is my point. But you have to be willing to have an honest conversation about it, you gotta be clear-eyed about it, and you gotta be intentional about it. And the jobs that I've held, by God, as you can probably tell from the tone of my voice right now, I am goddamn intentional about it. If you wanna change it, then you gotta step up and change it. The work we did at Massport led to the Massport model, which is now taught at Harvard Kennedy School and at HBS. And I'm looking for what's my next Massport model at the Life Science Center. And I think it's about workforce development and driving DA and I in, and I think we can do it if we drive the manufacturing and the regionalization back to the plant needs to be here. You can't build a plant in Kendall Square, for Christ's sake. <laughs> serious. I live in, and I love Boston. I live in Boston. I've been in Boston since 1995. I refuse to move out of the city. I bought four homes. I'm raising my family there. But I know what it costs to live there. You cannot build a manufacturing plant in Boston. It's not economically feasible. It doesn't pencil out. But I bet you I could build one in Brockton. I'm pretty sure I could build one in Lawrence or Lowell or Springfield, or Worcester, or Pittsville, or Lee. And oh, by the way, back to that, past this point, there'd be dragons. So I drove an hour, or an hour and a half. I'd have to get on a plane, right? So I'm convinced that we can convince these guys through relationship building and smart economic development and partnering with our partners in city, government, that we can drive this but only through intentionality. And so that's the strategy we're gonna focus on for the next two years of my tenure. 
And I'm open and willing to have a conversation with anybody at any time who think that they have potential solutions of what we in state government should be doing around those things I just talked about. I learned a long time ago, and this is you know, a, another blessing of starting my career in the Navy. I don't have to be the smartest guy in the room, and by God, I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. In the times that I am the smartest guy in the room, I'm actually quite nervous. <laughs> I want to surround myself with smart people, and then we take those ideas and we work on them. You hire the smartest people, you kibbutz with the smartest people, you commune and partner with the smartest people, and then you solve problems that way. And so if you've got ideas about what we should be doing in state government to make the life sciences system here in Massachusetts stronger, more viable, more accessible, more fair, I am all ears. And I'm happy to give you all the credit in the media when the time comes. Trust me, I will give you your props. So with that, I think I'm supposed to take questions, am I not? <laughs> Floor is open. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I'm gonna start off by saying that, oh, thank you, great, we have a few questions. Um, I'm gonna advocate for our region right here, right? We have amazing leadership, which is part of the, uh, of the issue, right, in, in corralling all of our resources from Chris Cooney to the mayor to Dottie uh, from Easton, and we have the schools, Stonehill, Massasoit, uh, and the vocational school. So I'm all in for trying to, to do that. And as a parent, as an educator, as an immigration lawyer, I can tell you the community here is, is ready to, to get out there, and I love the jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> So um, let's see. Yeah, one of these questions was about you know how do we get this region more of the life sciences investment, and you kind of talked about talking to sure. those leaders and things like that. Anything yeah, more? It goes beyond that. I mean, when you think about you know you know we have to be first. So you know, I believe in being clear-eyed, right? And what I mean by say clear-eyed is you know realistic about the situations that I find myself faced with the challenges I'm trying to work my way through. And, you know, as I've kind of circulated around the last year around the state, meeting with companies, getting out in the communities, going to schools, visiting the colleges, the research hospitals, you name it, you know, things start to form in your head. And one, you know, and so I say, so what, what are the elements that go into making a vibrant cluster, right? A life sciences echo cluster. And for me, you know, the answer is pretty straightforward. Because I look at where we are with Lowell, which I think is starting to take off. I look at Worcester, which I think is starting to really take off. And obviously, the Boston-Cambridge area you know, is what it is. But it's about having um, a core uh, set of, of academic and research hospitals or institutions. So you need to have a place where the scientists are being taught and where they're being groomed and cultivated and coming from and where the ideas for the new therapies and modalities are gonna be created. Then you need incubators and accelerators. Uh, you know, if you look at Lowell, you've got, for example, those two elements I just named. You've got uh, UMass uh, Lowell, uh, you've got uh, the uh, M2D2 uh, incubator and accelerator, and for those of you who aren't familiar with them, those are basically organizations that provide an economic way for young scientists, one, two employees, to come and rent space in a hotel type of model uh, and do their research in a very ec economic way, uh, economical way because they aren't having to invest in infrastructure, rent, and all those things that you, know, you have to worry about when you're doing a startup company. And so those two elements are critical. Uh, uh, you've got to have the place where these scientists are going to come from, and then you have to have a place where they can incubate and accelerate their idea. And then the other piece, which is great if you, if you can have it, and pretty typically I'm seeing this as the other element uh, in a, you know, kind of almost like a triangle, is some established biopharma in that space who are then going to take those ideas and either A, bring them into their company through acquisition, or do a licensing agreement with the young entrepreneur, et cetera, et cetera. Again, if I use Worcester as an example, you've got Worcester Polytech out there, uh, which is you know, the education piece that I talked about and, and the place where the scientists are being groomed and educated. You've got uh, MBI, which is, the, uh, which is the incubator and accelerator. 
And then you've got Abbey. And we're now building the reactory out there in Wuxi, uh, uh, which is a Chinese uh, company, life science company, has already signed up to be the key tenant and first tenant in the reactory, but there will be others. And so when I look at Worcester, I think it's definitely going in that direction in terms of being a really robust economic life science cluster in, say, my guess, probably five years. The same with Lowell. I can literally see it on the horizon. But in my head, I go, well, how do we make that happen for Brockton? How do we make that happen for Lawrence? You know, how do I make this happen in Springfield or Pittsfield or Lee? And so we've got to have those elements. We've just got to have those elements. Thank you, and I appreciate hearing about Springfield. I grew up in the area, so we're often considered that we've, you know, on another planet. So forget about the, the flat Earth, right? The dragons. <laughs> um, okay, so there are some really two great questions here. Um, one is related to building relationships with the youth, with youth organizations and kids, and getting them excited yeah. about these types of jobs. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts I, on that? I feel very passionate about that, and I. Bet you're saying, God, this boy's passionate about everything. Uh, but, but I do feel very passionate about it. And the reason I do is because uh, I'm a firm believer that, you know, based on my own experience of growing up in a small town in, in, in the South in the 60s and the 70s, that if, you, if, if, if you're a kid and you don't come from a privileged background, you know, how do you know that you can aspire to be an architect if you've never been around an architect. You don't even know a job exists. It's not, it's, not even in your, it's not even in your realm of reality. You know, how can you be an astronaut if you've, like, never met an astronaut, right? Uh, you know, in my case, a submariner and a nuclear weapons guy and an officer in the Navy was because my dad was a sailor in the Navy in, in Korea. Now, granted, he wasn't an officer, but, you know, it led me to a different path, is my point. And so, I went out to a school recently uh, in Boston for an event. And they were kind enough to invite me to come in a little bit early so I could meet with some of the kids uh, in a lab that we had funded. We'd actually funded this lab through the Life Science Center. And so I go in and there are about, I want to say maybe 10 or 12 kids in the class who were waiting to meet me which I was, you know, thankful for because it was lunch hour and we know I have three teenagers, so, you know, they, they're always texting me about money and running off campus, so I was <laughs> impressed that they actually waited for me. Uh, but first thing that struck me was, say, like out of the 12 kids, 11 of them were girls and one boy. So that struck me as like, oh, okay, wow, wasn't expecting that. Don't ask me why, but I wasn't. But then as we started talking, just spontaneously I asked them, you know, because they were primarily seniors, I said, oh, so who's going to college? And most of the hands went up, so that was... Okay, this is pretty cool. So I started asking them, what majors are you going to have? And I heard everything but science. Everything but engineering. Everything but math. I'm not kidding. Every single one of those kids talked about, you know, and hey, I'm a liberal arts guy, and I think I did all right uh, in life, but my point is, it's my lab. I mean, we spent the money, <laughs> like, to train them. You would think that the light would go on and they would go, oh, I could be, you know, a, a biochemist or I could be uh, an engineer, et cetera. I mean, that's the whole idea. And so I walked away from that. Granted, you know, it's anecdotal, but I did walk away from that saying to my staff, okay, something's broken, <laughs> right? Clearly something's not clicking here. We need to figure out how do we get these kids excited such that they understand that, you know, and I do think it is a little bit simple, though. I do think that what it is is, you know, remember when you were in school and you, and you had to take the French class, you had to take the civics class, you had to take the literature class, you had to take the math, you know, there, even though you wanted to be uh, a political science major, right? And so you tended to look at, I don't know about you, but I did, you tend to look at those classes, well, I don't really care about them, but I have to take them because they're required for my major, but I really cared about my major classes, right? Because I wanted to be a naval officer. So for me, anything to do with my Navy stuff, of course, that was my number one concern. Everything else was just stuff I had to take. I think that's what's happening here. They're looking at that as, oh, I had to take a science class, rather than this is a stepping stone to a career. And so we've got to go back into the schools. I think we need to start a lot earlier. I think that's part of the problem, too, was this was high school. I, we need to do more in middle schools. And I would even challenge us to start thinking about 
elementary schools. We need to start introducing kids to careers in life sciences. Stop, you know, stop focusing, correction, not stop focusing, less focus on the infrastructure and more focus on job creation and getting them excited and understand that they can have a really good living in the life sciences in various jobs. We need to introduce them to the jobs. And we've not done a great job of that, obviously. And we're gonna to have to do better. Uh, and, I, and I actually agree. I have two middle school kids and then I have some older ones and, and they don't get that uh, interaction. They don't. Just, I'm taking a science class. Uh, and it's so much of this chicken and the egg situation yeah, as well. And well it is, it really is. It's, it's, you have all your work cut out for you. <laughs> if you notice, I have no lack of problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you have some solutions, so we're looking forward to seeing those be implemented. Um, and so one of the other, you know, this talking about the chicken and egg, is yeah. this issue of living wages. Yeah. Um, and so this question is related to, you know, the high, high cost of housing in Massachusetts and the minimum wage, and what kind of pay scale are you thinking that these new, you know, thousands of jobs will have? I think Joe must have wrote that question <laughs> uh, uh, as a setup. Uh, cause, cause, because he knows this is another thing that I'm passionate about. Maybe it's because I'm a Southerner. Southerners yeah. are just passionate about everything because it's hot. It's mm -hmm. hot down there. Too much snow here. Where it's cold and you know, people are more temperate, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, you know, the other thing that get, gets my blood up about manufacturing and bringing people into the pipeline of life sciences through manufacturing jobs is because if you look at the starting salaries, typical biomanufacturing technician or quality tech or QA person, starting salaries in those jobs is somewhere around 60 to 65 to $70,000 a year. And that's with paid benefits, educational reimbursement, uh, paid family leave, vacation, sick days, all the stuff you enjoy uh, in a corporation as a white collar worker. And when I look around at our disadvantaged neighborhoods, our immigrant population, my wife is an immigrant. She's from Haiti. Her parents are here, live in Dorchester. Good, hard working people, working two and three jobs. They make me feel like a slacker when I have them over for dinner. <laughs> and I look at how hard they work. But if you looked at their combined salary, it's below the federal poverty line. Mm -hmm. Below the federal poverty line. And that's in my own family. And so I take it personally. I think that that is repugnant as an American. You shouldn't have to work two and three jobs to make, just to scrap by. And oh, by the way, if you get sick, you don't get paid, right? Mm -hmm. We bring them into the life sciences, it ain't about a job. I'm now putting you on a path towards a career. A career. Because these folks start off at $65,000, $70,000. Oh, by the way, and that is your base pay. If you do overtime, you can easily crack 100000 Easily. I kid you not. Without a college education. All you got to do is be willing to be trained and show up and do the work. And you're on the path towards a career. And if you want to go back to college, well, now the company pays you. They reimburse you. And in fact, they want you to go to school, so they will encourage you to go back to school and pay for it. And so I think that we can fundamentally change people's lives, is my point. And I think that anybody in public service, anybody who is serving the citizens of the Commonwealth in a job like mine, if you don't view it the way I'm viewing it right now, then I think you need to go get another goddamn job. Because our job ought to be about uplifting people and transforming their lives. Here is one of the things that struck me in my other job when I was running, running diversity for Massport, which, by the way, was a job I said I'd never taken in my career, and there I was doing diversity work. <laughs> so never say never. I was reading a report from the Boston Fed one night in my office. And it said that the economic income gap between the average white family and the average black family in the city of Boston was $235,000 to eight. I read it three times. 
because it was at the end of the day, so I was kind of like, okay, my eyes are bad, and maybe I'm just tired, and I went, and I picked up the phone and called my friend at the Fed, because I actually knew him, uh, and I said, is that right? And he goes, yeah, that's right. And I hung up the phone, and I went, wait a minute, I think I got it. You own your home, you build equity, you rent, you don't. Most black people in the city of Boston rent. White people have the advantage, in many cases, of owning their homes. I own my home. And so that's the difference. We need to give people jobs such that they can own a home. And then you start to amass generational wealth. And once you start to amass generational wealth, then you start to close the racial income equality gap. It's all connected. It's all connected. If you give someone a decent path of a career, you fundamentally change their life. And once you change their lives, then you change their kids' lives. Because the kids see dad and say, our mom, and say, hey, well, my mom works for Vertex and does this, that, and the other. Well, I can do the same thing. It ain't rocket science, and I know rocket science. When are you putting your hat in the ring for governor? <laughs> we need leaders like you. Um, you know, so much of what you said resonates with, with myself because I'm an immigrant, my, you know, my parents were immigrants and I'm an immigration lawyer now and I see that work ethic yeah. and I see the experience, you know, the lived experiences of so many immigrant investors who want to create jobs here, um, but because of our restric the restrictions in our immigration laws are unable to. And so we could probably even create more than those, you know, tens of thousands yeah. of jobs if we utilized the international students that come here who then take all of that knowledge and leave and, and go back to China, go back to the Middle East, go back to wherever they came from. Um, so I have a lot of ideas. I'm happy to reach out to tell you about how we can, how the state of Massachusetts and how the, um, you know, the Mass Life Sciences Center can use our immigration laws to help continue to build more jobs. So, so to that point, and you're always going to cringe. I'm at Kay Turner <laughs> at MassLifeSciences.com. And he and my chief of staff were just telling me, you've got to stop <laughs> giving out your information because my schedule is crazy. And it is, I, but, and, and I, and I, but I want to be accessible because I want ideas. I want to hear from people. Uh, and so uh, it's funny you bring this up because I was just having a roundtable discussion with some entrepreneurs in life science space who are Asian. And that was one of the things that came up, was that we need to look at our, you know, we need to think about green cards and how we think about that and da 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 da. Granted, out of my purview, but nonetheless, it, it planted the seed in my head that I need to kind of think about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I am accessible as the day is long. Do we have. <laughs> Did we have any other questions? I think these are the few that I had, and I don't know how we're doing on time. Is good? Okay. See, I could sit here and talk forever. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, you. I think uh, I have a little gift for you, if I can find it. We have a Metro South uh, Chamber pen to present to you, and I'm trying to find... Is it coming? Ah, here it is. Thank you so much, oh, Ken. It's our pleasure to have you here. The next Good Morning Metro Th South event is scheduled for Friday, February 18th at Thorny Lee Golf Club. February's Good Morning Metro South will be a lunch edition beginning at 11.45 and will feature uh, the mayor of Brockton, Robert Sullivan. It's going to be sponsored by OCES Old Colony Elder Services. And please save the date for Thursday, March 3rd for the Multicultural and Business Forum at Thorny Lee Golf Club from 5 to 7.30, sponsored by Northeastern Savings Bank. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna thank also quickly today's ambassador team, Rich Morgan Photography, Brockton Community Access Channel, the Enterprise News, and of course our staff uh, members at the Chamber, our host, the Martin Institute at Stonehill College, Dr. Hall, Dr. Bleakley, and finally, finally, thank you to our speakers, Ms. Emily Keyes Innes of Innes Associates and Eric Halverson of RKG Associates, and of course, Mr. Kenneth Turner, CEO of Mass Life Sciences Center for being here today. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful winter snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, but then I
under my own private law. I'm going to be the director of media technology. Oh, 